Good morning. Uh, I would like to thank Columbia Business School and Frederick Ebert Stilton to give me the opportunity to take part on this seminar. The onset of the current global financial crisis was almost three years ago. Since then, standard setters, economists, politicians, researchers have been studying this crisis and many lessons have been learned from these extraordinary events. Nowadays, we are engaged in a moot pronged debate in, on how best to address the major weakness in financial regulatory framework. The Basel Committee on Bank Supervision and other regulator setters have introduced a range of fundamentals, fundamental reforms to international regulatory framework. The reform can be divided into two basic groups, macroprudential and microprudential. The macroprudential reform focus is to address the system-wide risk that can build up across the bank sector as well as the procyclical amplification of this risk over time. The microprudential reform focus is to raise the resilience of the individual banking institution in periods of stress. In this group, the key proposals are the following, to raise the quality, quantity, consistency, and transparency of the capital basis, to strengthen the risk coverage of the capital framework, and finally, to introduce a global minimum liquidity standard. Brazil supports this reform agenda for many objectives and reasons. First and most important one is to achieve the global financial stability, paving a sustainable growth, avoid crises like the 2007-2001 and its socioeconomic consequence. Second, it is a fact that the world has become, mer become much more interconnected. Globalization has dramatically increased the linkage among the national economies. As a result, financial institutions and markets have become international, large and complex, beyond the scope of any national supervisor. Nowadays, there is no way for national supervisors to deal with transna transnational financial institutions and markets in an isolated approach. We need strong international coordination to implement a financial regulation as homogeneous as possible across jurisdiction. Third, we have been advocate that only homogeneous financial regulation can create a level playing field for financial markets worldwide. Taking account this general view, I would like to introduce the second part where I will talk about bank governance. Bank. This is the board. Sorry, yeah, I lost. Sorry. The 2007 2008 crisis exposed several examples of bank government failures. One particular striking failure concerned liquid risk. Many banks failed to address the basic principle of liquid risk management when liquidity was plentiful. Many of them did not have an adequate framework to deal with the liquid risk posed by individuals, products, and business line. Moreover, they had not considered the amount of liquid they might need to satisfy contingent obligations. In order to address the lessons learned from this crisis, the Basic Committee reviewed the sound practice of managed liquidity in banking organizations in mid-2008. This review detailed the guidance in key areas. This principle reinforced the importance of an enrollment of the board and senior manager in risk governance, not only quid risk, but in all risk that bank has incurred. The board and senior manager must clearly set the limits for risk taking and supervise the compliance of these limits. They should also pay attention to the adequacy of internal systems for identifying, measuring, managing and reporting risks. Is the board and senior manager involvement in risk policy and supervision, supervision a new approach to manage risk within a bank? No, it is not a new approach. Nonetheless, the lack of effective risk governance is one of the most report fa failure leading to this crisis. I took place, it took place even in some of the most sophisticated 
banks operate in some of the most developed governance environments in the world. Several studies have appointed problems in the board and senior managers as the main cause of the failure of effective risk governance. The lack of expertise among members' boards, the overlap of CEO and the chairman, the board's true independence, the incomplete risk information transmitted to the board, the lack of timely information to the board, the over-reliance of mechanisms to catch and report new inappropriate source of risks, creating the autopilot risk. The senior manager failed to ensure that the bank's activities are consistent with the business strategy, risk tolerance, and policy approved by the board. <laughs> and finally, the complex and opaque corporate structure that hid some risks. However, the most dramatic governance issue that reason from the financial crisis is the compensation practice of banks. Although this practice will be due to the panel, no, I would like to use this compensation scheme to introduce a third part of my speech, where you explain some Brazilian bank features regarding bank governance. First, it is important to highlight that in Brazil, most of the large private financial institutions are controlled by families or group of shareholders that hold the majority of voting shares. As a result, these groups usually control the board and also hold or appoint many senior managers positions within the financial institution. Therefore, Brazilian financial institutions are not challenged by agents' conflict of the same magnitude that has been observed in many developing countries where voting rights in many of the large financial institutions were provided in the market, which contribute to a biased compensation pipe. We have other problems. Although these are some differences, the central bank of releases last February a draft proposed rule for public consultation based on financial stability board principles for sound compensation practice. Besides, Brazil has implemented the international account standard number 24 requiring all financial institutions to disclose related board information since, since December 2009, account statements. The financial institute must disclose key management personal compensation in aggregate basis. Regarding risks, the Brazilian regulatory framework requires minimal mandatory structure for operational credit and market risk management. This structure must be compatible with banks' operations in terms of complexity and risks exposure. In all cases, every financial institution must appoint a responsible senior manager to report to the central bank. In addition, the board and the senior managers, ha are, managers are required to make sure that the compensation policies do not incentivate imprudent behavior or assumption of risks in high levels than the one state in the financial institution's long term policies and strategies. Moreover, we have comprehensive regulation and supervision. 21 modalities of financial institutions are under the central bank regulation and supervision. Not only financial institutions are regulated by central bank, but also holdings that have financial institutions as part of their business. The central bank is the agency empowered to license financial institutions to operate, to transform, merge, incorporate, expropriate, or change control. The Brazilian legal framework requires the identification of the controlling shareholders as well as the qualified participation, shareholders owning 5% or more shares. They must joint prove their economic and financial capacity. This requirement is linked to another important rule. Once the insolvency has been decreed, the central bank may call on the controllers to improve the society capital. In addition, in the Brazilian Bank Access Rule, all board members and senior managers must be approved by the central bank. In this process, the central bank analyzes if, if the candidate has the necessary reputation for taking office, exercise executive position in private finance institution. Controller, board members, and senior managers are jointly responsible for the liability assumed by financial institutions whether or not fraud or negligence has been established. 
In summary, there is a strong legal framework imposing responsibility against controllers, board members, and senior managers. In an extreme situation, they can respond with their own personal wealth in the bank sector, in the case of the bank sector. This legal framework was introduced in order to preserve the stability of the economy and to protect the interests of depositor, investors, and creditors. Moreover, it intends to reduce incentive toward excessive risk taking that may arise in the bank business operation. Regarding foreign-owned financial institutions, the Brazilian Central Bank has not issued license for branch. Instead, we required foreign financial institutions to constitute standalone subsidiaries, which could be described as a risk based mitigated form of supervisory ring fencing. These subsidiaries are subject to the same requirements and supervision as the Brazilian firms, and this regulation ensures that the central bank has full access to the books and records bank subsidiaries. This practice allo allows a clear delineation of responsibilities between home and host supervisors. Moreover, it protects our finance system from contagion effects on foreign banks' headquarters. As a result, in spite of the sizable presence of foreign-owned finance institutions in our finance system, we observe no important contagion effects during recent crisis, even in some cases where the headquarters were severely affected by finance 2007-2008 crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Last speaker is Stefan Jacobson. This way? Yeah. Okay, my name is Stefan Jacobson. I work in the uh, regulatory policy division at the OECD. Uh, and the title of my presentation is Achieving Regulatory Coherence in Financial Sector Regulation, the Potential for Regulatory Quality Tools and uh, Strengthen Public Governance. I'm not going to talk today about the governance of banks or the executive compensation, but about the institutional design of the regulatory system and some of the lessons that we have from our work on better regulation as well as drawing in some other relevant OECD work. Um, the OECD is an international organization of 30, close, now getting to 31, probably 34 countries when Israel, Estonia, and um, Chile joined this year. We are trying to interconnect macroeconomic and structural aspects and draw on the expertise of uh, officials from our member countries in a number of policy areas. Um, our multidisciplinary work on the financial crisis covers a number of issues. I'm just going to say that we do have some work on corporate governance and executive compensation, but since this was not directly my field and the time was limited, I would just uh, refer you to this and I will make um, a relevant report available. The work we do here, and I'm going to present, in, in covers some of the work on the policy framework for effective and efficient financial regulation that has been discussed by our committee on financial markets, as well as analytical work we did on assessing the extent to which financial sector regulators like the SEC, the FSA, um, the IMF in France were subject to better regulation requirements, that is requirements for transparency, disclosure, consultation, impact assessment, ex ante and ex post review of the rules, and we found a great level of heterogeneity. We also do have at the OECD some work on public governance in the context of the crisis, 
as we have drawn attention to the importance of lobbying and uh, addressing uh, <coughs> lobbying practices, because governments are never going to be able to resolve and produce adequate laws unless they also fix the lobbying uh, issue, because anytime you're going to do a new law, the whole process is kind of um, perverted. And we hope that um, there is some value in intergovernmental cooperation and coordination to address the externalities and the global issues. Um, as an introduction, we need some cycle proof regulation, and I think that would be comprehensive, contingent, and cost effective, as well as avoid under and over regulation. And if I look at financial sector from a global perspective as against food safety or scientific risk assessment, a risk, every sector has its codes of good practice, and they are sometimes uh, sector specific. The question is whether governments need to promote across the board general policies of risk management or governance that have to apply to every uh, sector. The other consideration we had is that some countries did weather the crisis better than others, and I'm going to draw on the examples of Australia and Canada. Australia, because we did a regulatory reform review of Australia, which was released this year and went on several missions to, um, to, to that country. And what was interesting to me is to see that there are the general regulatory aspects, but the institutional memory of banks play, played a role. And we saw the four major Australian banks, and one of them had been hit very hard by some financial crisis and dust 15 or 20 years ago, and we could see that in the context of the current crisis, they made no mistakes, they were much more conservative, and you could see that the memory of the CEOs had been hit and burnt by the crisis and acted as a deterrent to, um, to keep them cautious. And that was quite clear, and we saw another major Australian bank that had not been hit hard in the past, and we thought that they were overly too optimistic, and they were running into the wall with their lending practices. I'm not going to disclose specific names. There are only four major banks in Australia, so I could get myself into trouble, but that was um, a very interesting example. The other interesting country is Canada. This was mentioned by Susan Bees. And here, the interest in Canada from a, a governance perspective, a part of the fact that they have more conservative lending practices, is also that it seems that the, the application of um, better regulation or quality regulation requirements is very strong in Canada, as well as the ethics requirement to work in the public sector. The requirements for disclosure of uh, participation, of uh, the revolving door issues are addressed much more thoroughly by the Canadian culture of the public service, and that can also say a word in the way that um, regulation was applied in that country. You could also say probably, and if you want to be fully fair, that both of these countries have moderately competitive banking markets. That means their banking markets are competitive, but not overly competitive. And as a result, their banks were not pushed to crime, in a sense, to do more to enhance performance, because they kind of perform under um, a system of gentlemen's agreements. Um, the first uh, element that I wanted to share with you today is, does regulation matter? And in fact, we do have some work from the OECD's economics department with uh, regressions and analysis ba based on the data sets of um, financial market information policy indicators for eight areas of prudential banking of our 30 countries. And they did try some correlation analysis and regression to see whether the uh, robustness of the regulatory framework um, matters in terms of the financial stability, looking at the volatility of bank share prices for th 322 banks over 32 countries. They also looked at the cost of rec rescue packages and the financial soundness of the, re of the um, financial system. And in fact, yes, it's fairly reassuring. Regulation does matter, particularly the entry and uh, um, the ownership requirements and the entry and exit uh, elements. And so this study um, should be published or it has to be published as part of the um, annual uh, publication on going for growth. Um, and there is no clear trade-off between stability-oriented regulatory policies and competition. Uh, competition being measured in terms of net interest margins. The second element of OECD work is the effective, the work on the regulatory framework and this policy framework for effective and efficient financial regulation. As a general level also, the, this framework is kind of fairly 
technical and detailed. The OECD also supports leverage ratios and all bank assets, capital buffers over the minimum requirements, and the separation of certain investment banking activities um, as far as, for example, um, in the address of the, our Secretary General to Chancellor Merkel uh, about a week ago. The problem with our policy framework, which is uh, sound and detailed, and I guess everyone could agree on this, is how to implement this. And at least there has been an agreement by the representatives of the 30 nations around this policy framework, which gives a good basis for analysis and follow-up. The problem is to the, the extent to which we would be able to peer review, analyze, and monitor the implementation of such a framework. The second element, of the, uh, of the speech today is an, uh, an analysis of better regulation practices, which we did with, um, with Julia Black, who's a professor of law at the London School of Economics. And we, we did compare and analyze the various um, general rules and frameworks for financial regulation, including the Basel, IOSCO, IESCO principles, OECD principles, IMF principles. We also looked at the independence, accountability, powers of financial sector regulators across five countries, Australia, Canada, France, the UK, and the US. And, uh, and at a number of institutional arrangements, I have to speed a bit because um, we're still, the time is a bit short. And what was clear is that we found the results of this detailed institutional study is a lack, we found a lack of coordinated information on macro financial flows and macro prudential supervision. There was also insufficient coordinated action by supervisors nationally and internationally. And as has been well known, uh, we found that there were the delineation of regulatory boundaries left certain parts of the system unaddressed. That's this um, notion of black holes in the regulatory systems. And there were also issues in risk assessment and risk management. There was also an issue of um, a regulatory philosophy of self-correcting markets, too much reliance on the ability of self-regulation. You could say that particularly for the UK, because in general, the UK is thought to have a fairly thorough requirements for better regulation, but the way the FSC was applying this thing was probably fairly relaxed. The, the other element which is striking as a, from a foreign perspective is the extent to which the US system for financial regulation was fragmented and the fact that only part of this system was subject to the um, discipline of, um, of um, better regulation and regulatory quality. For example, the Federal Reserve, SEC and CFTC were partly exempted but, that, but the OCC was subject to, uh, to that uh, review of quality regulation. While if you compare in Australia, the two regulators, APRA and ASIC, the FSC in the UK, the OSFI in Canada, are all subject to this issue of um, ex ante review of uh, their um, new regulations. Um, in general, we found that there was generally good requirements for transparency in the financial system. Uh, particularly if you were to compare to other countries. What is, again, more interesting is this issue of coordination. There seems to have existed uh, sound mechanisms for coordination with the Council of Financial Regulators in Australia, um, <coughs> a supervisory committee in Canada, a Collège des Régulateurs in France, a tripartite agreement in the UK, while in the US, and all of this is before 2009, there was a rather fragmented structure um, and few uh, coordination arrangements to address that. And we also found that there was a very uneven practice of reviewing the stock of regulations and trying to update that. So the, the last stream of work that I wanted to uh, share with you today, apart, of this, apart from this better regulation requirements, is our general work on, the, on ethics and lobbying, as we think that um, any, any um, analysis and reform of the financial sector cannot be complete without addressing this. Uh, a recent IMF study called the mm -hmm. Fiscal of Dollars uh, established a clear link between lobbying and high-risk lending practices in the financial sector. We also noted in some of our reports, it was quite interesting to see that as soon as Fannie Mae and, uh, was, uh, went into public ownership, they, uh, they stopped uh, all of their lobbying activities. And uh, the prevention of future crises might require closer monitoring of lobbying activities. 
The OECD has been able to assemble 10 principles for transparency and integrity in lobbying that have been agreed at the level of Council of the OECD. Again, there is an issue as in terms of the implementation of those principles. Um, and the last point is the issue of revolving doors. Here, we have a report in progress. It's not yet agreed because the issue is fairly sensitive. It's the extent to which you can impose cooling off periods and um, requirements of disclosure and uh, limitations of nomination in terms at, the, at senior levels in regulators where different countries have fairly different views of what's going on. The OECD has been taking stock of concerns and has assessed the practices and however the options to provide guidance to help remain open and we still need to build consensus as work is making progress inside the house on this issue. Just to conclude, I think from a governance perspective, the issue is to restore trust in governments, to redefine what is the, uh, the public interest, and to give specific attention to the regulatory dimension in terms of how the rules are being made, how they are being updated in this sector, uh, how is coordination, transparency, and risk management, and I'm talking here at the level of regulators, are being addressed without losing sight that no good reforms can be achieved if broader governance issues are not addressed, including the issues of lobby lobbying and conflict of interest and revolving doors in the uh, financial sector regulator. Um, I think this is a dynamic policy debate and we need to keep a long-term perspective, but I just wanted to give you some framing, framing elements from the, the recent work we've been doing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think it's time to open it to the audience. Please ask your questions and direct your questions to the individual. Suresh? Okay, uh, a number of interesting uh, points. <coughs> I want to go to the point that Charlie made. Uh, and I do agree that uh, a significant part of the problem may be well outside the main focus of this uh, conference could be mm -hmm. political. Uh, political mandate, uh, and uh, uh, you know, Canada, Australia were some of the countries that were mentioned. Um, but I think one of the things uh, about the contacting there is that the mortgage loans are not uh, fully recourse loans, mm -hmm. uh, so that if you take a loan, you know, you can't walk away by just putting the house uh, back to the uh, lender. Uh, I would like to sort of hear, uh, I, I have discussed this a little bit with uh, Tano, uh, the conference has seen. Uh, I, I'm curious about the panel's view, uh, and, and I, I know that at least in one central bank has conference, uh, the governors of uh, the central bank of Australia and New Zealand commented that this was an important aspect as to why the crisis was not a big uh, factor uh, in those countries. I'd like to get a uh, reflection from you. The other point that I want to make, coming to the main focus of the conference, is Credit Suisse uh, came up uh, with a compensation scheme in which the idea is that, let's say that uh, the bank has a banner year and the bonus pool is very large, and then it is followed by a disastrous year, uh, then you have to give up some of the bonus uh, that you earned uh, during the banner year. So there's a clawback uh, that occurs. And this is becoming uh, more and more common in hedge fund business because the investors, they do their due diligence and then they ask, well, you know, uh, we insist on a clawback. So if they're going to take 220 in good years, then you have to give up some of that if that is followed uh, by a bad year. And to what extent this could be a, a useful development uh, in, in mitigating this taking. Thank you. Please. Um, just quick responses on both of those. It, it's going to be tricky to disentangle the recourse element from the leverage limits. So in all the countries you mentioned, you can't have 97% leverage either. So Canada has a leverage limit in particular, I know. I believe Australia does too, but I know Canada does, Hong Kong does. So uh, recourse obviously is going to be interacting with leverage because if you're limited to 75% leverage, recourse is not often a binding issue. So it's going to be difficult to disentangle that. On the Credit Suisse compensation, uh, here's sort of an academic uh, idea that I think we could toss around a little bit. 
there are two ways to make um, equity incentivize compensation more long-term in its focus. One would be to have a vesting period that's very long. The other would be to have a short vesting period with clawbacks. And that's interesting to, to then compare those. One of the advantages of the clawbacks is that it, get, it doesn't uh, have the same liquidity problems for the recipient. That is, the recipient gets use of the money right away. And so I think it would be interesting in theory to compare these two things. And I don't think that, you know, I'm not aware of any study that's really done that. tell you the U.S. I mean the, the problem here and, and I have this reaction to a lot of this discussion that we're having is statistically it's going to be very hard to really answer your question. What we know is that all of the really sort of glaring problems, uh, um, Wash, Washington Mutual, uh, especially AIG, were related to the OTS. So if you were looking at this crisis you would say the OTS seems to have been a pretty poor quality regulator, and there, and we know that AIG purposely chose the OTS, and so we, we could, but I would also say pretty small sample, one-time event. I'm not sure that we're going to be able to draw very strong conclusions, but they're suggestive. Some of these glaring examples are suggestive. The history hmm. of uh, regulatory choice in the U.S., generally historians have reached the opposite conclusion. They reached a conclusion, I could point you toward a lot of financial history of regulation, arguing that it has been beneficial in the U.S. to have competition between regulators because it doesn't necessarily create a race to the bottom. So I, I think there's a tendency maybe to overreact a little bit and to overbelieve this story, even though I'm sympathetic to it. Yeah, I just wanted to add one, one issue to that, you know, which is, I mean, I think uh, you know, and again, going back to the issue of Spain, Spain is dominated by two very large financial institutions, the Bank of Spain, you know, whenever they have an additional uh, supervisor, essentially, they send it to one of the two because they are the two systemic institutions. Uh, there's an issue there, and there was a very famous case quite recently, where the head of the Santander team in Bank of Spain was hired by Banco de Santander. And of course, this you know, it's not a good thing. You know, there's this revolving door that I believe uh, Mr. Jacobson was, uh, was, uh, uh, was mentioning. And, uh, you know, this is a very serious problem. I, I don't see how to solve the problem by paying our supervisors much better. So they feel that uh, the security of the job that they have in uh, uh, an august institution as the Bank of Spain uh, prevents this temptation to join precisely those who are supervised. But I, I just think this is not politically feasible. So I just have a are very pessimistic that you can solve this problem. Anybody else? Yes. This, does work. this works? Yeah. And just a few things. I would have some slight concerns about the notion that uh, competition among regulators is something that is good because you're not so sure that the always preserve the public interest. The second point is that we did some work on revolving doors, which is not yet public, but which shows that the extent of the collusion between regulators and the, the, the financial sector is, of course, in a sense, much more of an issue in those countries which act as global financial hubs, particularly the US, but also Switzerland, which is also a, a tiny country. However, the, I think the point is that it is to some extent inevitable that you need to draw an ex expertise in financial sector regulators. And the point is not to say that you need to appoint people without experience. The point is making sure that in the boards of the financial sector regulators, you have a mix of expertise, people representing the industry, but also people representing the consumers and also people representing the public interest, just coming with a public 
institution nature that you have the right mix and also that when people come from the private sector they are obliged to disclose their um, their personal interests and that you have clear walls in order to ensure that their decisions when exerting public service authority will not be biased by past or future personal financial interest. The second point I would also say is that I didn't have time to say it about Australia. Another interesting thing about the Australian feature was that there was a separate regulator for prudential matters as against ASIC, which was a general regulator. And the view that we heard there, talking to a number of people, is that this had um, enabled them to make sure that the supervisory, the prudential mm -hmm. aspects were mm -hmm. properly taken care of because they were in a single entity with full authority. Well, if you work in an integrated regulator, such as was the case for the, uh, in Germany, BAFIN, IMF in France, or the FSA in the UK, the model of the integrated regulator meant that the prudential aspects were just one department within a general regulatory structure. Well, if you have it independent as one institution and one authority, then it can stand and protect for whatever it thinks that its, its mission has been designed for. Brian? Yeah. Uh, Three fast points to the question. Uh, first, somebody up there is going to write a paper on updating the implicit guarantees and how they're a problem. I mean, between the US GSEs, the Landis Banks uh, sponsoring SIDS to get around and the expiring Euro state guarantee and the Cajas, I mean, everything we talked about in advance of the crisis that we were worried about came true. Um, so that's just for somebody to do. Uh, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not a researcher, by the way. So I can delegate. <laughs> uh, one of the things I think Charlie's uh, point raised to me was to think about. You know, I've been obsessed. Uh, Hamid knows about CEOs who are also chairmen of the board and the incentives that creates. It strikes me that we haven't spent enough time thinking about how board of directors are compensated. They're getting paid cash. Uh, which isn't necessarily <coughs> tied into the shareholder's interest or a long-term view. Maybe we need to think about that as well, small point. Uh, Professor DeMasso, De the, the question I had asked uh, Susan Byes before, actually you went to, which is how much of any of these governance changes is going to matter in the absence of people actually having liability? You know, I think one of the problems with U.S. law right now is if you look at Delaware law, it's almost impossible for people to have liability within that construct. It has to be gross negligence. So I think we may have to think about what the liability threshold is. And it strikes me some of the clawback is a way to add some element of liability without actually calling it liability. And the question uh, was for either uh, Professor Calamaris or Professor Jacobson. Uh, in your OECD statistics, you said the concentration of ownership was statistically significant or a significant factor, and I'm wondering if it's significant in the way that, you know, Charlie wants it to be significant, or is it significant in the other direction? Yeah. They, cause, they can cause opposite problems, obviously. But uh, let me just add to your first uh, list, the, the uh, Fiducia legislation w also was a casualty of the, the safety net. Um, basically, we created in 1991 uh, a very narrow systemic risk exemption under Fiducia, which we yep. academics thought was really going to work, and uh, politically it was thrown out the window uh, by uh, uh, the politicians and the regulators. And one of the things that that gets to, which is this broader issue I'd like to bring up, which is w you know, there's a lot of discussion about uh, the incentives of bankers. There's not a lot of discussion here about the incentives of regulators. It's not just an issue of screening the regulators to make sure they're not part of a revolving door. It's a question, what do regulators do? And we touched on this in our discussion of whether there's races to the bottom and all the rest of it, because it turns out that it's quite relevant to figure out what regulators' incentives are, and it's not part of this discussion. Are regulators overly conservative, or are they overly liberal uh, in their treatment of bank risk? And I would say what we have right now is a very mixed uh, bag on that, um, and if you believe that they're overly liberal, then you think that you're worried about a race to the bottom. If you believe they're overly conservative, you like regulatory competition. Um, I would say that it's also very state dependent. That is, it depends on what state of the world we're in, how regulators behave. But my observation is I have a model, an implicit model, that says that regulators care about themselves. That's called human nature. 
and that they don't often do the right thing because their incentives are basically to care about themselves. And that right thing can be too conservative and too liberal, and that that's not something that, that we're discussing much. Uh, I would also say, in response to the comment that, that Stefan uh, made, you know, that OECD, I want to see this OECD study and all these statistics because they fly very much in the face of all the previous research that's been done and published in refereed journals on exactly these topics. So Barth, Capra, and Levine have studied at great length for over a decade exactly the issues that, that he's raising have reached exactly opposite conclusions. So it's going to be very interesting to see how the refereeing process deals with these uh, studies. Charlie, for your benefit, I am a regular. Uh, okay. So sends me email at 5 a.m. that Hamid, you should read this SSRN paper. <laughs> so, and in fact, he was asking me, have you read the paper by Babchak that appeared yesterday? I said, no. <laughs> so, um, uh, any, Susan, yeah, please. So those of us who have been promoting the idea of sub-debt, including myself, for two decades, uh, always argued that it wasn't enough just to require sub-debt, but that you had to also mandate no bailout of sub-debt, and that you had to also make the least cost resolution policies of the FDIC, not allow implicit bailouts in, and so that there's actually a fairly long list of making sure that that is a binding constraint. And as you know and just said, basically that was all thrown out the window because we didn't have a narrow uh, legislative prohibition against bailing them out. And in fact, the Dodd bill included a caveat, which was taken out at the last minute, that would have allowed the FDIC to insure 100% any debt on planet Earth anytime it wants to. That was uh, taken out. We don't know. Maybe it's going to go back in because it, it is part of the House bill. So there are these wonderful uh, political caveats. And we have to worry because the politicians and the regulators, when the crisis hits, just want to bail out everything. So the incentives about conservatism and liberal uh, behavior are, are very relevant here. Now, the reason contingent capital, I think, has so much merit as a form of sub-debt is that because it would convert, if designed properly, into equity long before the insolvency moment, then you would already have an implicit haircut and a much more credible one. And so part of the reason that literature is moving toward contingent capital away from just straight sub-debt is because of the greater credibility of that haircut. Any question from this side of the room? Yeah. Yeah. He, he wants to say something. Oh, please. I mean, uh, Charles talked a lot about the taboos in uh, the American political response and to what extent it uh, bracketed out a, a big part of the problem. And in Europe, we have a similar sort of distorted policy response, uh, which has a lot to do with sort of going after the financial market. If, if you believe that the bank regulation, sort of the banking sector and the financial markets are to some extent substitutes and we have to, to talk about the optimal uh, size of the banking sector sort of going after the financial market with transaction taxes and now f uh, sort of interdictions of certain transactions is very much like shooting uh, the ambulance and uh, a, a, another dimension to this is that good governance probably needs a lot of uh, financial market information as inputs so there's a lot of complementarity that is sort of destroyed between uh, an extension of uh, trading of lots of risk and the quality of corporate governance. So these are two dimensions in which the European corporate, uh, the, the European policy response to the crisis is completely distorted, and not even not only leaves out uh, constructive changes, but even goes in the wrong direction. But that's um, a side note. Yeah. 
Thank you very much, and please join me. Thank you all the speakers.